Welcome to Advanced Dungeons and Testing Dragons Temple of the Golden Cobra. This is the Finding the Ark scenario, the first of the six that you will be confronted with in this adventure. Remember, in the Finding the Ark scenario, we're going to focus on refactoring the test suite of an existing cookbook. So we're going to be using the RSpecs helper and shared examples. Let's get started. The musty crypt takes on a rancid odor as you descend into the lower catacombs. Around each bend and curve of the hand-carved caves lie shelves housing the bones of the monks that were once ceremonially buried below. Several of the open graves are overturned and the bones are spilled and scattered to the floor. Out of the darkness, you suddenly hear the screeches and snarls. Your light spell, torch, or low-light vision show that you have stumbled upon a band of goblins standing around the ark you have been searching for. None of them smart enough to use it, and you hope in a few moments of far less of them so they aren't able to transport it. All right, so that gives us the introduction. And the reason why the first combat happens to be goblins um, is that it seems quintessential. Whenever you're doing any kind of work with any cookbook that you come in contact with, it's not so much the big challenges, you know, the big creatures, the big problems you have to face. It's the small creatures. It's the distractions that get in the way. The minions, you know, that are standing between you and successfully accomplishing your goal. And this can be represented or can be seen inside of the cookbooks that you work with. So we're going to take a look at first the ARC cookbook. So if you change into the ARC directory in the cookbooks that you downloaded or cloned for this adventure, you'll find that the ARC cookbook contains a test suite that you can execute. And particularly, there's a test file there that's being used to test all of the code paths inside of the default recipe. There, you'll see right away that if you run the test, everything passes and it completes successfully. Now the trick is when you open up this test file, you begin to see some of those goblins uh, inside of the implementation. So you want to open up arc spec unit recipes default underscore spec. And I'm going to open up that file in my editor here so you can take a look at it. So here you'll see that the implementation is going to be testing across multiple different code paths. Essentially, when a platform happens to be unspecified, when it's CentOS, when it's Debian, when it's FreeBSD, Mac OS X, etc., etc. Now, what you'll find that when you look at every one of these scenarios, all of them have a very similar setup. They all define a chef run. They all list a list. Uh, they all list all the necessary packages to be installed. They list all the packages perhaps not to be installed. And they also make sure, at least some of them, make sure that particular attributes are being set. Now, if we move through every one of these, we see a common pattern uh, appear where we do the same thing over and over again. And ultimately, if we want to test every one of these platform scenarios, you'll see that this file continues on for 200 lines. Now, while it's fairly clear what is being done here, I think that we could make this clear and even more succinct by using a number of these RSpec uh, techniques that I'm going to show you. And this is important because the less time we spend reading code and immediately understanding it, how it becomes more evident, uh, the easier it is for us mentally to continue to move through the rest of the code, right? So again, this concept of sort of these minions or these goblins that get in our way oftentimes consume a lot of our thoughts when we're not focused on the major goal, you know, the major thing that we're trying to defeat in a scenario. All right, so that's the focus of this scenario. That's your essentially uh, what we're going to be working on. And this redundancy in the test suite is going to continue to grow and grow as we add more uh, paths through the code, more platforms to support, or the, you know, the platform versions continue to grow and change. And your goal is to reduce that size and complexity of the test suite. So let me show you the tools you can use to get through this encounter. And there's two in particular that I want to show off. The first one is let. Let is a helper method, a memoized helper method provided by RSpec that allows us to essentially create uh, an object that we can reuse through all our examples and perhaps in other examples as well. 
It's important to note that it's lazy evaluated. So what's nice is it isn't essentially executed. The code is not executed until it is used. Uh, this prevents uh, essentially long startup times when you execute your test, right? You'll immediately start getting feedback, you'll get small pauses, then you'll get execution. And then of course it's memoized and that means that the value is saved. So when you load up some value, when you say let this helper value be this, once you load it once, it'll essentially <coughs> be available uh, multiple times and you won't have to reload that content. Here is a link to the information a little bit more about let. You can read the RSpec documentation. Let me show you more on how it is actually used within the code that you've probably seen. So if you open up one of the recipes here, for, or excuse me, the uh, tests or the specs for the recipe, you'll see that we already use uh, Chef Run. Most people are familiar with that because ChefSpec is automatically generated with the Chef Run helper. We see let is the RSpec helper method. This is something given to us by RSpec. We provide to the let helper, uh, essentially the let method, a symbol. And that symbol represents how we want to reference this thing that we are creating later down in each one of our examples. We provided a code block. So you see that number three. Between the do and the end there, we have a code block. And that code block is where we're going to set up this object. So first we initialize a solo runner or a server runner. We then ask it to do uh, essentially converge to describe recipe. And then in Ruby, the last uh, essentially item within this block, in this case the runner, is being returned. So when you call the chef runner, it's going to, or chef run, excuse me, it's going to create the runner. Converge it on the described recipe, which is this one right there, the arc colon colon default, and then return this runner object, which we can then use here within every one of our examples. Right? So this is very powerful because it makes our test clearer. Right? Our chef run helper is defined up above, and then within each one of our examples, we can just simply use it. Now it's important to know a little bit about the flow of this because it's a little bit different than writing a Ruby method. And this is where that memoization comes into play. So that memoization is a programmer term to really describe what we're gonna do, what we're gonna kind of walk through here. So number one, chef run sends a message. So when you type in chef run, Ruby evaluates that and immediately looks to see, is there a variable or a method named chef run? It does not immediately see a local variable named chef run, so then it immediately calls out and says, hey, does anyone have chef run defined? Our spec essentially has defined this chef run object, so what happens is it invokes the contents of the block. So it looks at that block, right, the contents of that block. It executes that code immediately then. So that's where we mean lazy evaluation, right? Lazy evaluation means only execute when we need to. In this case, it's only executed upon the first execution of it on that number one step. We invoke the contents of the block with the number two step. And then what happens is our spec will store the contents of that execution. I can't quite show it here in this file, but really what we really what's happening is it's being stored in memory. It's not being represented here in the code, but that chef run object is available. And when we get to step four, when we call chef run again, really what happens is our spec doesn't go through the whole process again. It retrieves the value that we stored essentially in step three. So the first time and only the first time does it ever get loaded, and then it's going to save us a, uh, execution time every single time after that, every time we use it inside this example. And I'm going to be very clear, it's only in this example. And we'll talk a little bit about the other path, which is when you use it in a different example. So when you use it with an example, number one, we load it and then we store it. And then number two here, essentially, what was on uh, the previous slide, we use that stored invocation. Now, when we use the chef run object within a different example, we actually load and store it again. So we go back to the beginning again, and we recreate that chef run object. And this is incredibly important because we want our tests to act in isolation of each other. Right? If one test were to do something to the chef run object, make some changes to it, we don't want that to affect our other tests or other examples because then we have order dependent tests or we have some spurious, you know, some some failures that pop up every once in a while or don't pop up at all and then immediately pop up when you get to say your continuous integration environment. Right? So we want to make sure we have a clean environment each time. So in each one of these examples, we have different Chevron objects. This gets recreated each time. And that's something very powerful about the let object that I really enjoy.
Now, this is how we might use the let uh, within our current code. And this is actually, if you look at the, essentially the spec file that I showed you before, the implementation of Chef Run looks very much like this. We define a runner, we specify some platform details, and then we converge that described recipe. And I believe by default, it's returning the runner object there, at least in this code example. So there's something that we can do. We can use lets inside of other lets as well. So not only can you define, say, the runner objects, essentially the chef run object, but any details that might be stored within that runner object or used within that runner object for its creation can be extracted into its own let. And the reason I like to do this is that I think it makes it clear. So if you look at the code, say if I switch back to this right here, we'll see that the chef run object here defines the solar runner, defines the platform information over here. And I think it would be clear if that information was being described a little bit lower, right? In a way that's a little bit clearer and easier for me to view and to actually edit or change. Um, a benefit of having it in this separate sort of helper right here, this node attributes helper, is it allows me to expand it, change it, grow it as I need to without messing with the original helper, which doesn't need to be messed with, right? It doesn't need to be edited all the time and could get pretty confusing or complicated as that list of perhaps node attributes grow as well, right? So that could get complicated, confusing. We could create some errors. We could forget a comma. It's a little bit clearer if we extract that information into its own helper as we see down here below. So that's one technique you can use to isolate particular pieces of information, variable pieces of information. And what's nice is you can essentially use these lets in a com, uh, com combination way. So let's talk about a little bit about each one of these lets. When you define one let in one scenario, in one context, so we have one context here and we have another context here, or at least the beginning of one, we see that we define a chef run here, right? So there's a chef run here and there's also a chef run here. The thing is, these are not the same as each other. Because the lets are defined within an individual context, in this case, siblings of each other sitting right next to each other, they will not collide or override or replace each other. Each context, each chef run we define inside of one scenario is different than we see in another scenario. So it's really powerful. So we can define essentially a chef run for each one as we need. And of course, that's exactly what's being done in the existing specification. But there's something also important to note is that really what happens is when you define a chef run in a parent context, the child context actually inherits that one. So sibling contexts don't share, but a parent context, essentially here, we have this describe arc default. If we define a chef run here, this is actually available inside of here. And it's actually available inside of here, but if it's available inside of here, what we can do is override it. So if you see here, we define a generic chef run that says, hey, I want to load all the values that you have stored inside of node attributes. And I'm going to define node attributes right here as this very generic kind of empty thing. So if we don't do anything, really all this information goes inside of here. Right, this is number one and number two. Both the chef run and the node attributes kind of appear here. And anytime you use chef run or node attributes, it'll be exactly the ones described here. Now, in this next context, this one defined here, we uh, inherit all of these, but we immediately override the node attributes defined uh, in the previous context or the parent context. So, really, what happens is we inherit this chef run. And then instead of inheriting this, we don't get it, we replace it with the node attributes here. So what's nice is here you see we can define a chef run object at the parent level. We can say, hey, just load the node attributes. We can make it default just apparently nothing, right? Just an empty uh, set of attributes. But within each context, we can just define the node attributes, the thing that we want to override, that we want to make special. Um, you essentially replace the default in, our, in each one of our scenarios. And this is a great trick to immediately shrink up a lot of the chef run information and make it a little bit more succinct when we write our recipes and our essentially our specifications.
Now that's only the start. The second move that you can do is called shared examples. And shared examples allow you to take uh, behaviors, uh, in this case, like particular expectations or examples that you see repeating over and over again, and you can reuse them within different contexts. So what you do is essentially find out sort of common expectations you're writing, and then you can move them into its own sort of special context and then include them where you need to. So we'll take a look at this and how this might work. So remember, looking back at our code that we've defined, we may extract something like, hey, why don't we put the list of all the installed packages into a let? And then we'll override each one of these installed packages inside of its own context. And then we might be writing ourselves, might be writing for ourselves the same uh, so essentially example in each one of these, right? You see this example right here, it installs the necessary packages, install packages each do. So this is an array of package names. We expect the chef run to install the package with this name. And if you look down here below, this is doing the same thing. It's the same example we've written here as in here. The only difference will be essentially the list of installed packages. Again, this is a very powerful move that let allows us to do. It essentially allows us to make these look you know, very similar to each other. And now that we've made them look very similar to each other, what we can do is we can take that example. So here's that same example that we wrote in the two places. We can move it into this thing called shared examples. We can give it a name right here, installs packages. And we could define one or more examples inside of here. And then within each context that we want to use it, we can just say it behaves like installs packages or whatever the name is that we chose up above. So what's really powerful is that we can define a bunch of examples here and then we could reuse them in multiple locations. And this is particularly powerful when you have uh, multiple platforms or multiple versions within your platforms to help you out. So we see here, it's kind of its own block, you know, its own sort of uh, context in which it's being defined that's independent. This is very similar to the Ruby's include. When you build a module, you can kind of import that content, bring it into or include that content wherever you need to. This is what's happening here. We're taking this code and we're essentially inserting it into both of these locations. And this allows us to edit just this one location. So when later we want to define new characteristics throughout what it means to install packages, we can easily do that by making a change in this one location and not having to go through multiple locations to edit the same or very similar looking code. All right, so those are the concepts that you're going to use to accomplish this mission. And your exercise is to refactor the ARC default recipe, uh, essentially the specification, that default recipe specification, using this let keyword and the shared examples. And what should happen is you should be able to run chef exec rspec, essentially, on this file. And then all tests should pass. And more importantly, um, of course it should pass, more importantly, we should see the size of that file decrease.